If you will, please turn to the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 21. Isaiah 21. Our text will come from that chapter, verses 11 and 12. Isaiah 21, 11 and 12. While you're turning there, I hope to accomplish in this lesson the answer to Watchman, what of the night? First of all, we'll note the watchman. Secondly, the night. And thirdly, the message. So now we'll read from verse 11 beginning. Isaiah says, The burden of Duma, he calleth to me out of Seir. Watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? The watchman said, The morning cometh, and also the night. If ye will inquire, inquire ye, return, come. Now, to help everyone understand that we must preach as well as defend the whole WHOLE counsel of God. To be God's watchman is the purpose and the aim of this sermon. Having said that, I want us to look at the text we just read. Isaiah, the great messianic prophecy who li- a prophet who lived over 700 years, about 750 years before Jesus walked this earth, speaks of what we can call the burden of of Duma. We would normally think of Duma as some kind of place, but not here. One commentator said this, quote, the name as it stands here is symbolical and without any demonstrable topographical application. Duma is deep, utter silence and therefore the land of the dead, unquote. And that's from Kyle and Dalich's commentary. So we have then the burden of the land of the dead. The burden of the land of the dead. So we need to ask, what is that burden? And it is that of one who is calling out of the nearby mountain range of Seir, Edom, or Idumea. Herod was an Idumean Arab. And they cry out, what of the night? Or how long the night? Contextually, the Edomites were looking for deliverance from the night of the Babylonian threat. Sometimes we think of the Babylonians just threatening Judah, but you've got to realize they were interested in all those places. The duplication of the expression may represent the intensity at which they felt the pressing of the night. And so they cry out to the prophet Isaiah, watchman, which says something of the word of a prophet, doesn't it? Watchman, what of the night? Now notice the reply. The morning cometh, and also the night. If ye will inquire, inquire ye. Return, come. Well, he says both morning and night are coming. And for whom comes the morning? And for whom comes the night? Again, contextually, the morning was coming for Israel and the night for Edom. Spiritually, spiritually I say, the morning came for those who inquire, learn of God, apply the message, and repent, then turning to God. The night It's for those who do not. 
So we have in this passage, I say, the watchman. First one we said we would look at. The watchman. He's simply God's messenger. I don't know how anyone can read of the prophets of old. And if you're going to be a faithful gospel preacher, do not stay long away from the way the prophets did their work. I don't know how long, how long someone can stay or how one can investigate, I should say, the scriptures and not see that he's God's messenger, the watchman is. In this case, of course, it's the prophet Isaiah. He is God's watchman. It would do well for people who would wear correctly the name gospel preacher or the term better stated gospel preacher and not realize the importance in preaching the whole counsel of God and in continuing with the faith, the necessity of being a watchman. Now, in beginning our study, not only do I want to read, as we have done from Isaiah, but I'm going to another great prophet. This is the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 3 of Ezekiel, verses 16 through 21. Ezekiel 3, 16 through 21. Now let's get something in mind. We have moved now, as far as time is concerned, for a couple hundred years or thereabouts, down to the time after Babylon had begun to deport people from Judah. And this prophet, Ezekiel, is now in the captivity. He was doing his work among those Jews that were captive, but before Jerusalem had fallen, which is while Jeremiah was doing his work in Jerusalem and surrounding environs. Each prophet had a burden for the Jews. And one of the things that Ezekiel was to do is say, you might as well build out a state and settle down here because you're not going back for 70 years. Because as Jeff will pointed out some time back, they just didn't have in their head that this was going to happen. But Ezekiel was saying, yeah, it's going to happen. Where are you now? So we read from Ezekiel, and we begin in verse 16. And it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at thine hand. Then notice verse 19. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turned not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way. He shall die in his iniquity. But thou hast delivered thy soul. Again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin, and his righteousness which he hath done shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require at thine hand. And then verse 21. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live. Because he is warned. Also thou hast delivered thy soul. One thing I want to say here before we go on through the main lesson is that we learn something here about a fellow who might be, or a woman, faithful over a period of years and then grow weak and finally apostatize or be overtaken in a trespass and not repent. Did you notice that none of the goodness he did while he was faithful is going to be remembered? Sometimes I hear people say, oh, so-and-so is a good man. You better ask God what his definition of a good man is. 
And that's one reason in Revelation 2.10, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Yes, let's give me the Bible and let it define for us what we need. So he must give the message. Whether it's speaking good as to what's going to happen to the people or bad. Now to do this, he must not be a respecter of persons. Romans 2.11 reads, There is no respect of persons with God. In Acts 10.34, God is no respecter of persons. There are those who seek to please people, not to save them. That's very important. For those who love righteousness, who love God, who love the truth, who study it, who are striving to change their lives to fit the New Testament teaching, I want to please those people. But that's not what's being talked about. The idea is, well, so-and-so is important, or he gives a lot of money, or he's whatever he is. And therefore, you alter the message to keep him happy. God doesn't operate that way. We cannot seek to please men. Paul put it this way to the Galatian churches, Galatians 1.10, For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were yet pleasing men, I wouldn't be a servant of Christ. James wrote all of these writing the Christians, but... Maybe Acts 10.34, where it's just giving the record of what happened. But James 4.4 4 reads, Ye adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity, which means hate, with God? Whosoever therefore shall be a friend of the world maketh himself an enemy of God. There are those who will always be ready to compromise God's message simply to get along with people. His attitude is that of Micaiah in 1 Kings 22, 14. As the Lord liveth, what Jehovah saith unto me, that will I speak. That is, those that will not respect persons have this attitude. In Galatians 1, 8 through 9, the same sentiments there. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, or uh, that has been preached unto you, let him be anathema or cursed, literally cut off from God what God thinks of false teachers. As we've said before, so shall I now again. If any man preaches any other gospel to you than that which we've preached unto you, let him be accursed or anathema, which means, again, I say, cut off from God. Luke tells us in Acts 20 and verses 26 through 27 concerning what Paul had to say to the Ephesian elders. Wherefore I testify unto you this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. Why is that, Paul? For I shrank not from declaring unto you all or the whole counsel of God. Today, the church of the living God, the leavening influence for good in the world, God's family, the kingdom of heaven, each one of us in particular is expected to be a leavening influence for good in this world by what we say and what we do. Into our hands has the gospel been given. Into our hands, the defense of that gospel has been given. Today, then, we are his watchmen. We are not of the night, but we are of the day. Listen to what Paul said to the church of Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 5, 4, and 5. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you as a thief, that is, the second coming of Christ. And you could say it this way of your own death, since we don't know when we're going to die, but we will. Then he says, for you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. We read also in Acts 26, 18, how that the gospel is to open the eyes of people, that they may turn from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive remission of sins and an inheritance among them that are sanctified by faith in me. We have an obligation then to do the work of a watchman and not stand as idle souls 
while all die around about us in their sins. Then I said we want to talk about the night. The night, is all, the night always represents that which is dark and you can't see. Thus, it's representing uncertainty. Have you ever gone through your familiar house with all the lights out? Especially if you're barefooted. Whatever will be there that you never would step on, otherwise you will kick it or you will step on it. Sometimes fall over it. Why? Because you don't have the light. You don't have the light. Well, when it comes to going to heaven, it's the light of the gospel. It's the truth. And if you don't know it, Satan's going to put a Lego toy there for you to stand, step on or something bigger for you to fall over. You can't see when it's dark. That's not such a profound statement, is it? So how can we know the way? In Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 19, we find this. The way of the wicked is darkness. They know not at what they stumble. John 12, 35. And he that walketh in darkness, Jesus said, he doesn't know whither he goes. One cannot find his way. He's uncertain. In John eleven ten, 10, But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because the light is not in him. So the word of God's watchman always illuminates. In Psalm 119, verse 105, the familiar passage, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Again, in John 8, in verse 12, Again, therefore, Jesus spake unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in the darkness, but shall have the light of life. Now, the only way Jesus grants that is through his word, the gospel. The night has always been a dangerous place. You know, in Texas, long about the early part of the 19th century up through past mid-century in the 19th century, if you lived out from about where Kim was raised, on back up to the Panhandle and down to the southwest, you were in Comanche territory. Comanches killed more white men. We already talk about the Mexicans, which they loved to kill when they got to where it's hard to kill white men. They killed more white men near the Indian tribe. And they had what was called in a full moon of the summer, the pioneers of those days said that was Comanche moon. Because Comanches could see enough to get around, but it's dark enough to hide from you. And I read an account that was written in about the 1890s by an elderly woman who was reminiscing the days when she was a young woman when the Comanches were still a fearsome group of people to have to deal with. And they were asking her her thoughts on various things. And it was a full moon night. And she looked up at it. And she says, I'm glad I don't have, have a dread of full moon anymore. We've never experienced that kind of thing. But notice all that's taking place when it's dark. Because the enemy holds the night. In Ephesians 6.12, Paul says, For we, re we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You might find this strange, but it's the truth, and the quicker that a true gospel preacher knows it, the better you'll be. When you preach the whole counsel of God, when you apply certain truths as they meet certain issues with a desire to refute the error or the darkness, and uphold the right, the light. One of the things you've got to get into your mind, because you see you're trying to change people from error to truth. You must recognize that those people in error are in the night and under the control of he who walks in the night. 
And thus, when you're preaching, while you're hoping to change people and reach people and convert them to Christ with the only way that can be done, the gospel, you're really fighting against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and all such things, spiritual wickedness in high places, because that's what they're being controlled by. Now, they're not being controlled by those things against their will. So you're preaching the truth that they can see they should will to turn away from those things because they've been captured by Satan. They're of the night. He doesn't walk anywhere else and turn to the light of the gospel and with the people of God so walk. So we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. In the proclamation defense of the gospel, we're after a much bigger game in the sense of who is the, origi the originator of a lie. And who was a murderer from the beginning? That's who we're fighting. He just got control of most people because he's the prince of this world. Colossians 1.13 says that the lost are in the power of darkness. The blindness of night always brings hazards. Some of you older folks will start thinking and remember this how that uh, you don't see quite swell at night like you once did. And that bothers you. And you can get to a point to where you'll just have to stop driving at night. That can happen. So when the Lord chose light and day, or light and darkness, and night and day, look at the wisdom he chose in simple things to show such profound things from evil to what is good. Isaiah 56, 10 states, His watchmen are blind. They are all without knowledge. I like this one. They're all dumb dogs. They cannot bark. Dreaming, lying down, loving to slumber. In other words, they're not doing what a watchdog does, what you want him to do. And thus, watchmen can be the same way. At night, we're blind, as I said. This is Luke 6, 29. And he spake a parable unto them. Can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall into the ditch? So when we go out with the gospel, what kind of world are we going into to preach the gospel? And what are we trying to root out of weak brethren? Weak because of their lack of knowledge of the truth and they don't believe it. Well, the world is in the night. It's controlled by Satan. It's not the exercise of the truth of the gospel that's creating night out there in the world or trouble for half-baked Christians. It's the devil through his false doctrines. They're in the night of sin. In John 3, 19, and this is the judgment, that the light is coming to the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their works were evil. Nobody has any expectation of heaven without God. Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus in chapter 2 and verse 12 of that book, that ye were at that time separate from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That describes a person outside of Christ. They have no mediator between God and man working for them. They do not have Christ ever living to make intercession for them. They cannot pray a prayer and expect it to be heard, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. They can't and they do not have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. They're lost in sin. They're separated from God. And so there are the night. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 7, For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that are drunken, are drunken in the night. So there are multiplied millions to fit it into the context of our lesson in Isaiah. Multiplied millions who are crying out, what of the night? Now, what are we going to tell them? 
You know that we're to tell them something. We are the elect of God. You know what somebody told you. You know what somebody taught you. You know what you believed, and you know what you obeyed to become a Christian and cease walking in the darkness and walk in the light. So now we come to the message. The morning comes. As far as Israel is concerned, yes, they're going into 70 years of Babylonian captivity, but they're going to come out of it, at least a remnant of them are. The morning is coming then for the faithful. It doesn't make any difference how bleak and how terrible things are in this life. When you are faithful to God, in the end, you win. In 2 Peter 1 in verse 19, Peter writes, and remember most of what I've read to you today was written to Christians. That is what came from the New Testament. And we have the word of prophecy made more sure. Whereunto you do well that ye should take heed as unto a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. And then not long before the pen of inspiration was about to be laid down forevermore in the book of Revelation, chapter 22 and verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright, the morning star. But then there's also the night that's coming. There was going to be a continued night for Edom. They weren't going to get over the Babylonian captivity. Thy night remains again for the wicked. Peter says in 2 Peter 2, 4, For if God spared not angels when they sinned, but cast them down to hell, and we studied about that not long ago, where they actually went, and committed them to pits of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And then in verse 17 of that same chapter and book, these are springs without water and mist driven by storm for whom the blackness of darkness has been reserved. There's no daylight for them. So then the conclusion is inquire and turn. How many people, even certain ones in the church, have lost all sense of inquiring to grow and develop in their knowledge of the truth and then in the application of the same. That's the only way you're going to change. It's the only way any of us changes to be more like Christ. Edom was exhorted to inquire concerning the Lord's message and repent of those things that were hindering it. And so today, the greatest exhortation you can give to people is to get them to heed the Lord's words, to learn them, to apply them, and to repent of their sins and obey God. We even know that time goes on to give people the opportunity to repent. The Lord loves us. He doesn't want to see anybody in hell. But we're free moral agents. We can choose. The devil's voted against us. God's voted for us. We hold the deciding vote. What will we do with Jesus? So Peter said the Lord's not slack concerning his promise, his promise to return. And some men count slackness, but his long-suffering to usward not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Then we have the great statement made by Paul, as Luke records it, on Mars Hill. What a statement it was. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. How sure is the judgment? As sure as that Jesus was raised from the dead by the Father. So what will our attitude be toward the message of the watchman? What are we doing about it right now in our lives? Watchman, what of the night? So let's remember the watchman. Let's remember the night. Let's remember the message. If you're not a child of God this afternoon, I beg of you and plead with you to seriously consider becoming one, to believe in Christ, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, 
and be baptized by his authority in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for the remission of sins. The Lord will add you to his church, and therein you can be faithful till life is no more on this earth, and heaven will be your home. As a child of God, have you been headed for the night by your actions, or by your love of the Bible, or lack of it? Or are you headed for heaven by seeking to know more and to be more active in the kingdom according to the authority of Christ? Well, if you find things in your life that are handicapped to you, you need to get rid of them. The only way to do that is repent of them and confess those sins and pray God for forgiveness. It's wonderful that God has made a way for us to be saved. And if you would, you can. And that's the way it has been with all people for all time. So if you need to obey the gospel, we invite you to come to Jesus while we stand and sing. <laughs>